All warfare is based on deception. Of the Modern Warfare series, the third one is easily the least talked about. Not because it's an inherently bad game, but because it's massively overshadowed by the giants that are the first two. Both of which are famous worldwide for being some of the best multiplayer titles of the time. You would be hard pressed to find any young person who hasn't played or even heard of these games. They both added so many of their own ideas to the franchise that Call of Duty and even gaming in general would not be the same today without them. So Modern Warfare 3 is a weird one. Sure, it's still one of the best selling games in the series, but so much of that is due to the title alone. And looking back, this game lacks its own identity. It's often viewed as a kind of Modern Warfare 2.5. Admittedly, I myself even view it this way. Having not played it for so many years, the first two entries in the series are such standouts in my mind, whilst the third seems like it had nothing to say. Despite this, it is perhaps the game I played most as a child. I mean, I was obsessed with this game. I must have played the campaign through dozens of times. My brother and I didn't have access to a reliable internet connection at all during this time, even though it was 2011 and we couldn't play online multiplayer. So we had to settle for split screen survival mode, an aspect of the game I think most people won't even remember existed. Going back to play this game again, I feel like I understand it much better than how my 10 year old brain interpreted it. And so I'm gonna talk about two of this game's modes, the ones I played most as a child and the ones which I think provide this game with some semblance of an identity. Starting with the campaign, which I'll recap in case you don't keep every detail of the Modern Warfare story banked in some corner of your brain. In the first game, there was a second Russian civil war between the existing government and this new ultra-nationalist party led by Imran Zakhaev. And despite much foreign intervention and blowing Zakhaev's brains out at the end of the game, the ultra-nationalists win. In Modern Warfare 2, an airport is massacred, which was believed to be carried out by an American CIA operative, despite the fact that a very Russian-looking Vladimir Makarov was caught on camera killing these people. This paired with Russian anger over the death of Lenin 2.0, Russia decides to invade all of Europe and America simultaneously, starting World War 3. Bingo bango bongo, I'm not even going to mention this fucking guy because he doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. There's this big battle in Washington DC where us Americans win and begin to turn the tide of the war, and now we're here. This game's campaign starts by edging us with a flashback to the previous games, but then disappoints us by making us play as some new ooey gooey characters. The first playable mission has us playing in Delta Team as a new character called Frost. He's this game's generic US Army character, as every Modern Warfare entry has had up to this point. In COD 4 it was Paul Jackson, and in Modern Warfare 2 it was Ramirez and Joseph Allen. These characters are ultimately much less interesting than playing as any of the Task Force 141 characters, but I think they exist to add a more grounded, realistic military feel that you don't get from the one-man army British Special Forces missions. We're to make our way through the streets of New York into the stock exchange and onto the roof so that we can destroy these Russian signal jammers. It's a pretty straightforward objective. This mission feels like it sets the precedent for the rest of the game's missions, which is spectacle. And the first one starts pretty strong. Though the objective is the same as usual, fight to a thing, then fight away from the thing. Shooting through Wall Street, the physical embodiment of American capitalism, gives us a nice reminder of what we're fighting for. I particularly like that the character Grinch is voiced by Timothy Oliphant. Look up! What the hell? What the hell? In fact, the entirety of the Delta team is voiced by massive actors. None of them have any real backstory, of course, but Infinity Ward really splurged on the cast for this game. They're gone. The next mission immediately follows the first. It has us infiltrating a Russian submarine so that we can fire its missiles at its own fleet to destroy it. And I don't know what it's like to be in the military during a world war, 
but I feel like the same team of four people would not be taking on both of these insanely important missions within minutes of completing the first one. And my theory about the purpose of these Delta Team missions is immediately proven wrong as just the two of us take on an entire submarine. It's common knowledge that the Modern Warfare series turned what was a grounded World War II shooter into an action movie, and I get that this is the direction they wanted to go in, but I really wish there was something to make you feel like you couldn't single-handedly take on the entire Russian army. Because completing just these two missions, the enemy force is kicked off the east coast and out of the US in its entirety. Either way, this mission is a short and sweet one, and it's also very pretty as well. The next mission is the one everyone's been waiting for. This takes place immediately following the final mission of Modern Warfare 2, and has us trying to save Soap, who has just been recently massaged by a small knife. It's also confusing at first as to how we're playing as who we're playing as, a whole new character who was not in the last game, because we came here straight from the desert in quite a hurry. I'm just wondering when Nikolai had the time to make a quick stop and pick up his friend Yuri. Where the fuck did the doctor go? The game would have me believe that he died, but there's no body. Was he late for something? Did he just walk out? Regardless, we stab Soap with what could have been polio. I don't know, I'm not a doctor. And we shoot our way out of this compound. But not before Price takes his sweet ass time opening this gate. Meanwhile, the enemy is literally committing war crimes right in front of us. That was a lot in a very short amount of time. This game is making it no secret that it prefers unearned explosions and the killing of waves of enemies as opposed to a coherent story. What was even the point of that mission? The reason behind us being here was because Nikolai says, Dad, I know a place. Yet already, when we get there, Makarov supposedly knows where we are and sends his guys to come kill us. Just so that we could see a doctor who either died and vanished or just had somewhere to be within only 5 minutes of operating on soap. Also, so that they could leave me behind so that I have to run through a bunch of enemies whilst being bombed by a pilot with the world's worst aim. I feel like off-screen, Price gave Nikolai quite the talking to after chauffeuring us directly into the arms of the enemy. Anyway, I'm glad to say that after that shit show of a mission is a pretty fun and interesting one. We play as Andrei Kharkov, a bodyguard to the Russian president who has decided to try and negotiate an end to this war, and we're on our way to peace talks in Hamburg. Just quickly, this game's story is stupid, as I would often forget the entire plot and the purpose of what I was doing during some of these missions, so I'm going to properly establish the current story behind this mission in particular. The president of Russia has acknowledged that the war needs to be ended and is traveling to peace talks. Makarov, however, has taken Zakhaev's place, and he believes that the war must continue and that Russia should engulf all of Europe. So I guess you could say that President Voshevsky is Hirohito and Makarov is Hideki Tojo, to make literally the nerdiest fucking comparison I could. Though what I don't really understand is how Makarov has the loyalty of the military. He's not necessarily in charge of them. In fact, at one point he's even established as an enemy of the Russian state, so I don't know how he's calling the shots. Anyway, now that that's established, we can proceed. The plane is raided by Makarov's guys to put an end to the possibility of peace, and the plane is eventually forcefully grounded. And let me point out the obvious by saying there is no way we would survive this plane crash, especially after being punched in the face by an engine. The rest of this mission isn't too complicated. Our goal is to locate the president and secure his safety. You shoot past a few guys before reaching the president and the helicopter that we think is about to save us, but instead it's sexy slow motion Makarov who fucking shoots us and kidnaps the president. Later on we see a news broadcast that states that the president never arrived at peace talks, but they do it in such a way that suggests they don't know why. I mean, his plane didn't arrive, are they not assuming that something bad has happened? Soap heals like he just sculled five potions of minor healing. Our first mission as a team has us traveling to Sierra Leone so that we can once more plant the Union Jack on their soil and slaughter their people. This is a stealth mission, or at least it is for about three minutes before we unnecessarily break stealth. A commonality we'll come to see throughout the game. Our purpose in being here is so that we can locate some type of cargo that will lead us to Makarov or something. 
I don't know. This time Price actually suggests that we should save this poor civilian who is about to be burned alive. So I guess that's progress. Gold star. But hold on, not even two minutes later, Price orders us to just watch as three innocent civilians are killed in front of us. To be fair though, he does look like he feels at least a little bit bad, but I guess I have to still take away his gold star. Price and Soap somehow get themselves seen while I'm on Overwatch, and for the second time already in this campaign, they've left me behind to catch up to them. I'm starting to think they're doing this on purpose. The enemy escapes with the unknown cargo, just as I nearly get my arm ripped off by a fucking hyena. But it's okay because I blow its brains out before it can take my arm. I do probably have rabies though, because I googled it and apparently it's a big thing over here. Who would have thought? So the cargo we just missed was sent to London, and now we play as a random British SAS guy. Who cares what his name is, I have a feeling he won't be around for much longer anyway. Our mission is to infiltrate a warehouse of terrorists who house something suspicious. Though they're loading cargo into these white vans marked Charity Worldwide, so it appears the secret cargo is Sour Patch Kids, and the operation may belong to His Majesty Prince Andrew. Make sure they don't wake up. I thought that Sergeant Walcroft sounded familiar, and it's because he was also the voice of Ghost and Gaz. I don't know why Infinity Ward pulled a Bethesda here and hired one voice actor for three well-known characters, especially when Delta Team is voiced by every actor ever, but there you go. So the beginning of this mission reminds me a little of the stealth missions in the recent Modern Warfare reboots. You know, this whole idea of implementing realistic, high-risk, close-quarters stealth. But for some reason in these older games, and in this one in particular, you only remain in stealth for a very small fraction of the mission before something happens that makes you unable to utilize stealth anymore. In this case, there really was no reason why we had to break stealth. And if we were going to stop being so sneaky so quickly, why did we even do it at all? This mission becomes pure insanity once we start chasing a train through the tube with a truck. Again, spectacle. It's very cool looking, but that's about it. These civilians uh, also scream the same way they did in the airport. Davis Family Vacation is pretty unnecessarily horrific. It's this game's contender to no Russian, I guess, but it feels like it only exists to fill that role. I know what a gas attack means. I didn't need to be visually aided by watching this girl and her family be blown the fuck up to understand it any better. It's revealed to us that these gas attacks were meant to distract and disorganize Europe so that Russia could invade the entire continent. Our goal this time is to land in Hamburg so that we can find and rescue the vice president of the US who was meant to be the delegate or some shit at the peace talks that never happened. But those were at the very least meant to take place like days ago, so why he's still here doesn't make much sense to me. We land on the beach and we're told by the tank team to clear a path for them so that they can move up. And it's like, hey man, that's your job. This mission is a lot of uh, shooting through the streets and it wasn't very fun. My patience is kind of wearing thin for these missions that just make it seem like there's enemies everywhere. Being inside of a tank was cool, but it only lasted for like 5 seconds. There's a slow motion breach before we rescue the vice president, and that's it. I haven't even mentioned that there are so many slow motion breaches in this entire fucking game. This setting is very beautiful though, if you can get over these fighter jets that just seem to bomb various monuments and buildings for no reason. The next mission has us in Somalia, going after a guy called Warabi, who distributed the gas which was used in the attacks. In the introduction to this mission, we learn that Baseplate is actually Captain McMillan from the best Modern Warfare mission, all gillied up. You still owe me for Pripyat, and I'm calling it in. 
Easy, son. He's risen to become the director of British Special Forces. This doesn't really have any impact on the story, but I really like that this little character development was included. This mission adds a couple of variables that are interesting in theory. We get control of Nikolai's guns on his helicopter so that we don't have to painstakingly kill every guy ourselves. But we also don't get to use it for very long, and there are several instances where we could have used it to make the mission much easier for ourselves. Also, we're told that there's an impending sandstorm catching up with us. Though the sandstorm is not a cool dynamic thing where if you finish the mission quick enough you can avoid it, you of course get caught in it either way. We get the information that we need and now we're off to Paris to find Volk who made the bomb. This campaign so far just feels like running around the world looking for people who I don't really care about, and it really makes this game feel bloated. Here we group up with GIGN and run around through Paris. The main and really only interesting thing going on here is the destroyed, gas-filled streets. We get to use smoke to direct the fire of an AC-130 and the pilot's voice is also quite nice. Yeah man, we're in a sewer. We get into a car chase straight out of Fast and Furious, where car after car chases after us like they know exactly where to pop out. Yeah, he's dead as fuck. Now he is. Iron Lady has us in control of an AC-130. This is a trick I feel like these modern warfare games always have up their sleeves. As soon as I begin to tire of the formulaic missions, they pull out this one and suddenly I'm having fun again. The original AC-130 mission in Call of Duty 4 was an insanely important and meaningful mission in showing the player what modern warfare really is. It's difficult to feel the consequences of your actions when you're thousands of feet in the air, removed from the reality of the destruction that's taking place on the ground. This original mission makes you question the morality of employing such advanced weaponry on the battlefield. In this game, however, it loses all meaning. And a big part of that is the ridiculous nature of the setting. I mean, we're flying over metropolitan France, bombing the streets of Paris. The destruction of buildings, streets, and vehicles is treated as mindless fun, rather than a critical analysis of modern warfare. I don't know, it really doesn't matter all that much. It's just kind of frustrating that whenever this franchise does something right, they always attempt to replicate it later, but fucking butcher it in the process. Like, hey guys, remember this mission you liked from this really beloved game? Well, it's in this one. Isn't that fun? And I hate that I have to admit that, yes, it is fun. Fuck you. Oh, and the uh, Eiffel Tower collapses, because of course it does. The opening to this next mission has always been one of my favorites in this game. It's mostly a stealth mission through the streets of Russian-occupied Prague, and the atmosphere created by the weather, as well as it being super dark, make the beginning of this mission feel really cool. I remember I always used to get really freaked out by these shadows on the wall. I thought they were definitely going to catch us, and it's not helped by how slow Soap is to open this door. Again though, I hate that this game feels it always needs to break stealth so that we can loudly kill a bunch of people. Especially when in this case it literally breaks the story. Our objective is to meet up with the Czech resistance in this church, so that we can get up to a good vantage point overlooking Makarov's meeting and blow his arm off as per Task Force 141 policy. So Makarov isn't meant to know that we're here. We should be being extremely careful not to leave any trace of our presence. That includes hiding these bodies that Soap says we don't have time to hide. Because if there were any suspicion that Makarov was in danger, he would move the place of the meeting. Now of course, we find out later that Makarov is setting us up. He knows that we're here and he wants us to be here but we don't know that. Gaping plot holes aside, we reach the clock tower and prepare to kill Makarov. But whoops, it's a setup and Kamarov fucking dies and we get exploded out of this tall ass building and live because scaffolding breaks our fall, which like it might as well just be a bunch of mattresses because everyone knows how soft scaffolding is. Price makes me carry soap even though I just also fell from the same clock tower. As we lay soap down on the table, he tells Price my secret before traveling to Sovereign God. Now! Get off me! 
I've always remembered this sequence to be pretty heartbreaking, and it still is. This is the first time I've felt real emotion through this whole campaign, and it sucks that my favorite character had to die for it. The music that plays through Soap's death is so emotional that it rivals Coup de Gras, which played during Ghost and Roach's deaths in Modern Warfare 2. Brian Taylor's soundtrack as a whole has nothing on Hans Zimmer's from the previous game, but it still has the potential to slap pretty hard at times. This moment though is so short-lived, as Price somehow musters the strength to punch me down a whole flight of about 26 stairs. I have to say, it's insane that Price reacts the way he does. There could be a thousand meanings behind the phrase, Makarov knows Yuri, so I struggle to understand how he gets so worked up by this information. But Yuri then admits that he used to be very close to Makarov. He was there when Zakayev was shot, and on that fabled day. But Yuri became disillusioned with his boss, and as a result he got blasted. I'm actually mostly okay with Infinity Ward retconning this stuff in, because it doesn't really have a huge effect on the past two games, and it's actually kind of cool that in the remastered version of Modern Warfare 2, in no Russian, if you turn around and run back to the start, you'll find an injured Yuri bleeding out. But yeah, this development doesn't really mean anything besides that Yuri admits to knowing of a place where Makarov might be, an admission he could have made much earlier without Price knowing of his past. This mission, I think, has always been my favorite in this game, and again, it's about the atmosphere of it. It being night and raining, as well as it being a stealth mission primarily, I don't really know how to articulate it, but it just feels cool. I especially like this bridge part. We're able to break inside this castle's walls like little rats and listen into a conversation between Makarov and his guys. We learn that he plans on using the president's daughter as a bargaining chip so that he can get the nuclear launch codes, which is about as generic as it gets, but I mean it works, I guess. So we fight through the streets of Berlin, supported by the Germans and their lovely tanks, to reach Alana Voshevsky, the president's daughter, to get to her before the Russians do. Also, she's in the closet. But what I can't tell you about is her location. Uh, get it? That's a that's a, that's a that's a gay joke. After having a building dropped on us, we just miss out on saving the president's daughter. Though to be fair, I think that we could have easily saved her with plenty of time to spare if Sandman hadn't taken his sweet ass time reaching the room, all the while yelling at me to hurry up. So after fighting through one of the modern world's most historically significant and culturally important places. We're off to the world's next most historically significant and culturally important places. A diamond mine in Siberia, where for centuries Russians have indulged in all that their country has to offer living life to the fullest. This is where the president is, and this is where the president's daughter is going. It's a joint mission between Task Force 141 and Delta Team to stop the Russian ultranationalists from obtaining the launch codes and destroying the Earth. We're told to use night vision, but doing so is almost completely useless. This place is lit better than Target. We're able to rescue the Russian president and his daughter thanks to a valiant sacrifice from Delta Team. It was a little unnecessary. I always viewed this ending to be pretty upsetting, but now I don't really care. I mean, there's nothing else to be done with these characters, they serve their purpose in the story and there's nothing else for them. But Sandman saved Price, so he's a bit of a sweetie pie for that one. Upon ending that mission, the war is over. That's it, that's all we had to do. But there's still one final mission that remains, and it's taking care of Makarov, who as a child I waited very impatiently for two years to get the chance to be able to kill. And here it is. I've destroyed your world piece by piece. It's only a matter of time until I find you. You won't have to look far. For the first time this whole game, Task Force 141 isn't disavowed, though they probably will be again by the time this mission is over. The opening is a little reminiscent of No Russian, that black screen whilst we get audio to set up the mission. We start out in full juggernaut armor, which is sick. We storm our way into this hotel where Makarov is staying. 
There was no explanation as to how we know he's here. We just spent the whole game searching for this guy only to come up empty handed, but now Price just knows, I guess. Our armor doesn't really last that long. It gets supposedly shredded after being lit on fire from a helicopter which crashed into our elevator. You know, reasonable shit. This elevator sounds like a rubber duck. We charge our way to the helipad where Makarov is making a break for it, fucking jump into the helicopter and kill the pilot before crashing back down where we took off from. For a second, Makarov almost kills us, and apparently I wasn't button mashing hard enough in the beginning and he actually did kill me, but Yuri comes to the rescue so that we get the opportunity to tackle Maki and hang him. It's a relatively satisfying ending. I like that we get the objective completed whilst Price lights up a cigar in front of Makarov's hanging body. And so that's the campaign. It's slightly better than what you'd come to expect from a Call of Duty game. That being said, if you bring your expectations up to the standards of a regular game, it's not great. It tests my patience for far too long with mostly forgettable missions, broken up by the occasional somewhat interesting and memorable ones. I think that what this game has going for it more than anything else is the characters. Characters, I might add, that were established as likeable in previous games, and which this game adds nothing new to. Regardless, Modern Warfare 3 offers an adequate conclusion to the series, so that we can close the book that is this series. For about 10 years until two more of these fucking things are made. The second mode I'll be talking about in this video is a very interesting one to me, and as I mentioned at the start of this video, that is survival mode. It was the first time this mode had ever existed, and it never appeared again until Modern Warfare 2019, which I never played and I don't think anyone else did either. In case you're not aware, every Call of Duty release since 2008 and before 2019 has had three main game modes. Campaign, multiplayer, and a third mode. Third mode is always co-op, but what exactly it is would tend to depend on who was developing the game that year. For example, Treyarch had zombies, yes! and though Infinity Ward would later have their own terrible version of zombies, they were more known for these co-op missions introduced in Modern Warfare 2 called Spec Ops. Get it? Because uh, Special Operations, abbreviated to Spec Ops, is like the same as co-op. Cooperative, abbreviated to co-op, they both have op in them. So smart, Jason West. Thank you, Jason West. In this mode, you were essentially given an objective within a map that was more often than not ripped from the campaign. They were a relatively quick and easy way to satisfy the popularity of co-op at the time. But the success of Zombies was clear to see, and it obviously influenced Infinity War during the development of Modern Warfare 3, because within this game's third mode is a fourth mode called Survival. Survival mode is essentially the same as Zombies in its core concepts. There's a wave system whereby killing all the enemies in a wave gives you some time to cool off before progressing you to the next wave, which is more difficult than the last. The main difference being that these enemies don't think of you as a delicious snack, rather just a guy who really needs to be killed. Really though, the main difference between zombies and survival is how you attain weapons and upgrades. Whereas in zombies there are a limited number of basic guns on various walls around the place, as well as the mystery box, both existing as ways to attain new weapons. Survival mode allows you to buy whatever gun you like using a similar money system as zombies. The catch is that survival mode has its own full leveling system separate from multiplayer, and you need to be a certain level to attain the best weapons and upgrades. But guns aren't the only thing you can purchase. There's also an explosives and sentry gun type box, as well as a kill streak box, which even gives you the ability to call in a team of guys who all have different names. My brother and I used to get really attached to these guys and would always be super upset when the last of them died. This is really cool, but Infinity Ward didn't bother including everything from the multiplayer, and these boxes are actually quite limited. Despite that, this mode is genuinely a lot of fun, and I never used to get bored. Later rounds can get quite overwhelming, and it forces you to move around the map differently than you would in multiplayer, which gives you a really unique perspective on a map that you might have played hundreds of times before in multiplayer. They're also super weird to exist in between rounds when nothing is going on. If you've seen Jacob Jeller's video on artificial loneliness, you'll know exactly what I mean. 
Without a doubt, the best way to play this mode was split screen on Xbox as a 10 year old on a Friday night with a friend who was sleeping over, eating fucking Cheetos, wiping your dirty little fingers all over my controller. Listen, we were all filthy children once, and I believe we're all entitled to second chances and forgiveness. But if you were that kid who made no effort to, at the very least, wipe your hand on your pants after showing it in the bag of salt and vinegar chips, Maybe you don't deserve forgiveness. So obviously I haven't experienced playing it this way in like 10 years. So I was excited to see what multiplayer survival would be like in 2023 from a fresh perspective as an adult. And it didn't go well. We tried playing multiple different times on a couple different maps, but after the first few rounds, our game would desync in a major way. What the fuck is going on here? You are staring at the sky, shooting at it. Oh. No, that's not what I'm doing. Yeah, did you not just go down and I had to revive you? No, I didn't go down. You went down. What? I don't know if this was either of our fault or if it's just the PC port, but we couldn't do it. But you know what? That's fine, because split screen couch co-op made up some of my best childhood memories. And looking back, I'm glad I didn't have an internet connection to play online multiplayer with. I'm glad I was forced to play split screen survival with my brother for hours on end. There was so much potential for this mode to be expanded upon, but it never was, besides a couple maps added later in DLC, but who cares about that. Either way, I'm glad this weird one-off game mode exists, because truly without it, I wouldn't look back on this game so fondly. I think I'll end it here. This video is already far longer than what I'm comfortable with, and this shit is taking too long to make, so here's my conclusion. Modern Warfare 3 is an example of Infinity Ward taking the easy route. It's cheap, it's lazy, it capitalizes off the success of the previous two entries in the series. That might be a harsh assessment, but I really do not care for successful AAA development studios that rush games out yearly regardless of whether they're good or not. In my opinion, this tends to be the case with every Call of Duty since 2013. They're all ideas, and that's a good start, but they're so rarely fleshed out ideas, which is, I think, why the kangaroo warfare movement system exists. I feel like someone just shouted that shit out in a meeting and they were like, yes, but that's neither here nor there. And you know what, as far as cheap, lazy Call of Duty games go, this one is not the worst.